guys, welcome. Henry here with Dead History, and today is our next video in our Declaration of Independence Sino series. Today, we are taking a look at Samuel Chase, a free signer from the state of Maryland. We have some really, really cool stuff to tell you about Samuel Chase, but first, I need you to hit the subscribe down below, leave all your comments and questions, hit the bell, and drop a like. And here we go. Samuel Chase, and this is Dead History. Hey guys, welcome back. Henry here with Dead History, and the guy behind me, Samuel Chase of Maryland. We have some really, really cool stuff to tell you about Samuel Chase. Like, he was a Supreme Court Justice. And he was also impeached. We are going to tell you all about that. So did the likes, did the subscribe, did the comments, did the credit, whatever, did all of it. Now you got to go get the popcorn, the pretzels, the kid chips, the soda, the gum bag. The leftover Valentine's Day candy from Rabbit, and sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hey guys, welcome! TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our next installment of our Declaration of Independence Signer Series. And today we're taking a look at Samuel Chase of Maryland. Yes, our very first signer from the state of Maryland. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed the introduction by Henry uh, going solo yet again for the introduction. I thought he did a great job. Very, very proud of him, of course. Uh, and today I'm going to be mostly flying solo uh, for the audio portion here. Uh, you might get a guest spot from Henry, but we shall see. Of course, in this part one today, we're going to take a look at the early life, the education, and the early time in politics for Samuel Chase. Uh, so that's what we're going to do in this part one. Um, yeah, so I think we should just jump right into it. Uh, I don't have too much more to announce right now, so let's just do it. Our next Declaration of Independent Signer series, looking at Samuel Chase. Here we go. Samuel Chase was born in Somerset County, Maryland on April 17th of 1741. His parents, Thomas Chase and Matilda Walker had met and married in Somerset County. Samuel's paternal grandfather, also named Samuel Chase, was a freeman and middle-class citizen of London. A brick and tile layer, he owned several houses and parcels of land. Grandfather Samuel had five children, Thomas, Richard, Samuel, Bridget, and Mary. Richard, the eldest, became an Angl Anglican priest, and Mary, the younger daughter, married an Anglican priest. Both families emigrated to Maryland in the 1730s. Richard emigrated in 1734 and became a close friend and chaplain of Lord Baltimore. Samuel Chase had ensured that young Thomas was given a classical education and Thomas graduated from both Eton and Cambridge. At Eton, he earned honors in both Latin and Hebrew. Later, at Cambridge, he studied medicine and earned a bachelor's of physics degree. He returned to Eton and taught Latin and Hebrew. Apparently tiring of the academic life, he took passage to the West Indies, island of St. Thomas, to practice medicine. The sparse life on a small island did not agree. So he returned to England where he read for the Anglican priesthood. He was ordained in February of 1739. Shortly thereafter, he emigrated to Somerset County, Maryland and became rector of the Somerset Parish. 
Thomas quickly met Samuel Chase's mother, Matilda Walker. Her grandfather and father were prominent merchants and planters in Somerset County. They were patrons of the Church of England, and Matilda most likely was a communicant in Somerset Parish. Thomas and Matilda were married in 1740, and they moved in with her parents. As Thomas's stipend as a rector could not maintain a separate household. On April 11th of 1741, the Reverend Chase lost his wife and gained a son. Matilda Chase died in childbirth, her husband's medical training being of no avail. She left a strong little boy named Samuel to fight his way through an uncompromising world. In February of 1744, Thomas Chase was appointed by the governor of Maryland as rector of St. Paul's Parish in Baltimore County. Thomas and his young son moved to Baltimore, where Thomas established residence in the home of the former rector and bought his library and clerical vestments. St. Paul's was a large parish that included the small village of Baltimore Town. Although Rector Chase's stipend was barely sufficient to support himself and his young son, he tried to keep up with his wealthy communicants and remained in financial difficulty for years, regularly living beyond his means, a trait his young son observed and followed in his own life. Not much is known about Chase's early life other than he and his grandnephew, Jeremiah Chase, became friends and were homeschooled by Rector Chase in Latin, Greek, literature, and history. Though not college trained, the boys received a fair equivalent at home. Samuel and Jeremiah Townley Chase had parallel careers as attorneys, legislators, and judges. Their success was testimony to Parson Chase's effectiveness as a teacher. In 1759, at the age of 18, Samuel Chase moved to Annapolis and entered the law offices of Holland and Hall to be trained in the law and eventually to be admitted to the bar. In those days, the median cost of having a student admitted to a law office was around 50 pounds of sterling. And Samuel must have had assistance from his father for room and board. His meager resources drove him to accelerate his studies and to explore additional sources of income. However, there are scant references to his success in these endeavors. During his four years of apprenticeship in the firm of Holland and Hall, Samuel had an active social life in Annapolis, Maryland, making friends with young men and finally being accepted into one of the social clubs that were the hallmarks of gentlemen. He met William Packa, the son of a wealthy Harford County family. The two forged a friendship that lasted a lifetime. Samuel was gregarious and impetuous, while William was more inclined to stay in the background and influence others through his writings. Later, both would become principals in the rebellion. Both would sign the Declaration of Independence and William would become governor of Maryland. Still not on his own as an attorney, Chase met young Anne Nancy Baldwin. They were married on May 2nd of 1762. The match was one of love, not convenience, for Samuel's bride enhanced neither his social standing nor his material prosperity. Chase and Anne lived on the brink poverty for several years until Samuel was admitted to the bar and began his practice. Their first child, a daughter, was born on February 14th of 1763. They had seven children, four of whom lived to adulthood. John Hall became Chase's legal mentor 
and in his student years, Chase accompanied Hall in his appearance in various county courts throughout Maryland. Chase was admitted to the bar in March of 1763. In his early years of practice, Chase was forced to take cases that other more practiced attorneys shunned, viz. those of debtors whose defaults constituted the majority of cases before the courts. In taking these cases, Chase built a long-lasting constituency of the ordinary, middling sort, middling-class citizens who later formed his political base. He represented these citizens, either pro bono or with paltry compensations. Often, through trial postponement and stays of execution, he enabled his clients to get back on their feet and to repay what they owed. The city of Annapolis was created a municipal corporation by a charter in 1708. The corporation was governed by a 10-man common council, supposedly elected by the citizen voters, but in reality was a de facto self-perpetuating court body that paid scant attention to the needs of the city. Replacement members of the council were labeled placemen and were denounced and derided by middling sort voters. They needed a leader to become a major political entity. In October of 1764, Chase worked with the constituents of two tradesmen seeking seats on the council. Chase mobilized the city's shopkeepers and artisans to vote the two candidates into office. In November of 1764, Chase ran for one of the Annapolis' seats in the Maryland General Assembly Lower House. He won a highly contested, vicious, nasty election. His ability to put together a political force was demonstrated in this election. Chase had mobilized the politically disaffected along with his existing constituency to establish a dominant political entity. By the end of 1764, Samuel Chase was a locally prominent figure in in Annapolis. Popular with one faction and feared by the other, he could not be ignored by anyone. Chase's election to the General Assembly coincided with the British Parliament's passage of the Stamp Act, which together with the earlier Sugar Act constituted the first time the British had attempted to tax the colonies for revenue. Opposition to the Stamp Act spread throughout the colonies and even more so into Maryland, where Lord Baltimore saw the Stamp Act as a direct violation of the 1632 charter that promised Maryland immunity, I'm sorry, immunity from taxation by the crown. Although Lord Baltimore's government was obligated, de jure, to enforce the law, in actuality, they were much less inclined to do so. Massachusetts citizens found a loophole. The act could not go into effect without stamped paper. Therefore, the tax cannot be collected if the stamped paper could not be distributed. They seized upon the idea to convince the appointed distributor to resign so that no stamped paper could be available. So in August of 1765, the distributor was forced to resign by a sizable and angry Boston mob. When this news arrived in Maryland, the precedent for action had been established. An Annapolis merchant, Zachariah Hood, had been appointed to distribute the stamp paper throughout Maryland. On August 26th, a large crowd gathered in Annapolis and quickly turned into a mob, with Samuel Chase as the ringleader. Largely composed of tradespeople who had supported Samuel Chase's election the previous November, the mob was dedicated to removing Mr. Hood. 
The crowd fashioned an effigy of the stamp distributor, which they paraded throughout the town in a cart while a bell tolled mournfully. Hood's effigy was then flogged, placed in pillory, hanged, and finally burned. Crowds elsewhere in the province soon staged similar proceedings. The mob in Annapolis resembled, I'm sorry, reassembled on September 2nd and tore down the building Hood was going to use as a storehouse for the paper. This episode frightened Hood into fleeing to New York for sanctuary. The Maryland governor, Horatio Sharp, arranged for a British warship to keep the stamp paper on board, safe from the Annapolis mobs. Chase and his followers had ensured that no paper could be sold throughout the colony. Therefore, the Stamp Act could not be enforced when it became law. The Stamp Act went into effect on November 1st. General confusion ensued. Legally, courts could not function without the stamp paper. Seaports could not load or unload cargo, and newspapers were shut down. The colonists ignored the act and proceeded with unstamped paper in defiance of the Crown. The Frederick County Court was the first in Maryland to reopen. Chase was present for this event and certainly influenced this decision. Chase immediately resumed his law practice in Frederick County using unstamped paper. Well, looky, looky, looky here. I got a special guest looking to say hello. Well, hello, Mr. Henry. Hello. How are you doing? Good. Good, good. So what do you think of Samuel Chase? Uh, pretty interesting? Yes. Now, why don't you tell the people real quick, I mean, don't get into too many details, but was Samuel Chase's gravesite one of the cooler ones for you and I to go see? Remember, this is the one down in Baltimore where we had to yes. punch in a code. you remember? Yes. I mean, it's cool, but also very protected. Yeah, well, I mean, not necessarily protected, but it's... It's under lock and key, yeah. So what'd you say? It's kind of... Hidden. Hidden, yeah. It was cool though, right? Yes. That we got access to that. So uh, the people will see, of course, Samuel Chase's gravesite tomorrow in part two, right? Of course. Of course. So uh, what else is going on? Great job with that intro. You did an awesome job, dude. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. Well, appreciate you stopping by and saying hello. Samuel Chase, of course, our very first signer from the state of? Oh, Maryland. There you go, Maryland. Good job. Well, thanks for stopping by, Henry. We'll see you soon, okay? Okay. All right, bye-bye. Bye-bye. In other colonies, the Sons of Liberty had been established to press for the nullification of the Stamp Act. The New York Sons wrote to William Lux, a Baltimore merchant, urging him to set up similar committees in Maryland. Mr. Lux took immediate action to comply. Soon the Sons of Liberty were being organized in the Baltimore and Annapolis areas. The Reverend Thomas Chase was a member of the Sons Committee in Baltimore town. In Annapolis, the organizers were Samuel Chase and William Packa. The Sons of Liberty forswore violence, preferring to exert as much political and economic pressure as possible on the British. Along with others, they succeeded. In March of 1766, the Stamp Act was repealed. In Maryland, his resistance to the Stamp Act had made Chase a prominent political figure throughout the colony. His successes reinforced the new awareness that ordinary men were capable of assuming active roles in politics, thus beginning Chase's goals of either reducing or neutralizing the court party's domination of the General Assembly and ensuring men of the middling sort would become the dominant force in Maryland politics. Chase remained a member of the General Assembly until 1784. 
from 1767 through 1773, Chase was taken up with Maryland politics. He became known as a cart horse. At one time, he was on 21 committees engaged in legislation affecting his middling class constituents and other activities reflecting Maryland's growing disaffection with the British Parliament. Chase and Packer walked a fine line between their mandated loyalty to the crown and their increasing frustration, both with Parliament and with their British overseers. New anti-British factions arose, challenging the coalition that Chase and Packa had put together, and a radical insurgency movement grew in the Assembly. Although the Tea Act promoted major resistance in the northern colonies, Maryland had remained aloof. Responding to pleas from other colonies, Maryland formed a Committee of Correspondence in October of 1773, of which Samuel Chase was appointed as a member. However, the committee was dormant for almost a year. In May of 1774, the British passed the first of what were to become known as the Intolerable Acts. The Boston Port Act closed the Boston Port until the Crown had been compensated for the tea that was destroyed in the Boston Tea Party. Everywhere in America, the act rallied public sentiment to the support of Boston, which was seen suffering in the common cause of colonial freedom. As soon as the news of the British Parliament's action reached Annapolis, Chase convened a public meeting on May 25th that called for a boycott on all imports and exports to Britain until the act was repealed. Chase and Packa, along with the leaders of opposing political factions, were appointed to yet another committee of correspondence to persuade the other colonies to unite behind the proposed boycott. Within Maryland, the response was nearly unanimous, and on June 25th, a provincial convention endorsed not only a complete boycott, but also a call for, continent, for a Continental Congress to examine the colony's relationships with Britain. Their stand put Maryland, for the moment, in the vanguard of American resistance. The call for a Congress was general and spontaneous across the 13 colonies, but few other colonies so forthrightly advocated a complete cessation of trade. For the first time, this call to resistance placed Samuel Chase squarely in opposition to the crown. Clearly in the eyes of his British overseers, it could be only be it could only be construed as open sedition. Samuel Chase never turned back. Samuel was born on April 17th of 1741 in Princess Anne, Somerset County, Maryland, to the Reverend Thomas Chase and his wife, Matilda Walker. Samuel's father, Thomas, the only son of Samuel Chase, fled from England and sailed to Jamaica during 1738 to escape persecution under Cromwell the Protector. However, he remained only for a short while on the Caribbean island and moved to Maryland. About two years later, during January 1740, the Reverend Thomas Chase married Matilda. Matilda succumbed when Samuel was about three years old. Samuel moved to Baltimore with his father, who had accepted a position of pastor of St. Paul's Episcopal Church. Samuel received an excellent education in Baltimore under the tutorship of his father. Afterward, he traveled to Annapolis at about, at about age 18 to study law under John Hammond and John Hall. Another Marylander, William Packa, 
was studying law in the same firm. Although Samuel and William became friends at the time, neither had any thoughts of serving in a United States Congress together. After receiving his degree, he was admitted to the bar to practice law in Annapolis during 1761. Later, Chase was introduced to a young lady, described as being especially beautiful, named Anne Baldwin, whose widowed mother, Agnes, operated a tavern in Annapolis to support her family, which included Anne and her two sisters, Hester and Rebecca. Anne's father, Thomas Baldwin, had succumbed while in debtor's prison during February of 1762 and left no estate. At the time of his demise, Thomas's possessions, other than some household items, consisted solely of one cow. Samuel married Anne Baldwin on May 2nd of 1762 with the Reverend John Barclay performing the ceremony. They had seven children, Matilda, Tommy, Nancy, Fanny, Anne, Nancy, Sammy, and Tommy II. But three of them, Tommy, Nancy, and Fanny, died either in infancy or while very young. During March of 1763, Chase was authorized to practice law in the county court Frederick County, and soon after, he was allowed to practice in other courts across the colony. Subsequently, during 1765, he was admitted to practice in the provincial court. Chase, lacking the stronger connections of the Maryland society circles, was not inundated with clients. However, he remained persistent and diligent in his performance as an attorney and accepted the financial struggles that accompanied his initial years of marriage. Similarly, his wife remained extremely supportive. In the meantime, Samuel discerned that debtors seldom sought out attorneys and decided to seek out the debtors to increase his practice. His instincts proved true. Through the average man, his practice soon began to grow at a highly accelerated pace. Through 1764 and the first part of 1765, Samuel handled more than 400 cases in the county courts. About three years after their wedding, Chase, as the prosecutor for the mayor's court, found himself in an awkward spot when his mother-in-law was charged with selling rum to servants. Chase, the prosecutor, lost in court when his mother-in-law was acquitted, but no one in the family was disappointed in his failure to win a conviction. By the time of the trial, Samuel and Anne had already presented Agnes with two grandchildren, Matilda and Tommy. However, the latter succumbed during 1765. The year of Matilda's birth, Samuel received a stepmother after his father, the Reverend Chase, married Anne Birch, the daughter of Thomas Birch, known as the Chirogen and the man midwife of Warwick, England. During 1768, another child, Nancy, was born, but she died the following year. During 1769, with his family expanding, Samuel Chase subleased a property on the land of St. Anne's Episcopal Church in Annapolis from William Reynolds, but only temporarily as he intended to construct a mansion. The leased house was burglarized in less than a month. That same year, Chase acquired lot number 107 on Northeast Street at the intersection with King George Street with intent to construct a home composed of more than two stories. Prior to its completion, Chase, during 1770, also purchased an estate on the opposite bank of the Severn from Annapolis. However, by 1771... Construction costs had skyrocketed and the mansion remained unfinished. Samuel sold the uncompleted home to Edward Lloyd IV. 
the Chase Lloyd House still stands on present-day Maryland Avenue. Meanwhile, between 1766 and 1769, in addition to his private practice and duty with the legislature, Chase had engaged in land speculation by more than 1,400 acres as sole purchaser and another tract of about 2,000 acres in partnership with William Packa. However, during the time he was constructing his mansion, the Chase part of the tract was sold back to Packa. By the latter part of the 1760s, in addition to his own family, Anne's two sisters and her mother moved into the home of Samuel and Anne. Another addition entered the family when Fanny was born during 1770, but she died during 1771. Only Matilda, their first child, remained alive. Nevertheless, Matilda was not destined to be an only child. A new sister, Anne, Nancy, was born in 1771, followed by Sammy in 1773 and Tommy in 1774. The family, however, sustained yet another tragedy during 1772 when Chase's stepmother, Anne Birch, died, leaving five children, all of whom were then raised by Samuel. The Reverend Chase, in addition to having had five children with his second wife, also raised Jeremiah Townley Chase, his great nephew. Following the death of Jeremiah's parents, Catherine, who succumbed while Jeremiah was very young, and Richard during 1757. Jeremiah, born during 1748, and his second cousin Samuel became close friends. Jeremiah served in the state legislature, became an anti-federalist, and served in the U.S. Congress during 1783 to 1784. Meanwhile, Samuel Chase and others like Charles of Carrollton were in the forefront of opposition to the British taxation of the colonies. Following the Stamp Act, he became a prominent leader of the Patriots in Maryland. Samuel and some others, acting as a group of the Sons of Liberty, destroyed the stamps that had arrived at Annapolis and afterward burned the stamp officer, Zachariah Hood, in effigy. Charles Carroll, closely affiliated with the Patriots and later an ally of Chase, did not participate. His actions remained private due to his Catholic faith. The stamp incident was the only act of violence at Annapolis by the Patriots, but Chase was tagged as one of the leaders of the rebels. His notoriety launched his political career as the citizens became enamored with his actions and elected him to the Maryland Assembly. Samuel's keen intellect, double-bladed tongue, and excellent debating skills served the cause well. During 1773, Chase was an opponent of a tax proclaimed by the governor for the purpose of supporting the Church of England. A series of arguments for and against the tax emerged in the press. The former by Attorney General Daniel Delaney and the latter by Charles Carroll, who used the signature First Citizen. After Carroll exposed the illegality of the proclamation, Chase was one of the men who befriended Carroll and helped propel him toward his political career. After the governor was compelled to retract his proclamation, Chase and others held a mock funeral that included a military slant and the music of fifes and drums as the procession marched the proclamation to its grave. Chase and several others congratulated Carroll in a statement. Thanks for your nervy and mastery defense of the Constitution against the late illegal, arbitrary and oppressive proclamation. Chase was later selected as a delegate to the First Continental Congress held in Philadelphia. Samuel Chase was the son of the Reverend Thomas Chase, a clergyman of distinction in the Protestant Episcopal Church, who after his emigration to America, 
married the daughter of a respectable farmer, and settled for a time in Somerset County in Maryland, where this son was born on the 17th of April, 1741. In 1743, Mr. Chase removed to Baltimore, having been appointed to the charge of St. Paul's Church in that place. Even in Baltimore, at this period, there was no school of a high order. The instruction of his son, therefore, devolved upon Mr. Chase, than whom few, fortunately, were better qualified for such a charge. His own attainments and classical learning were much superior to those who had been educated in America. Under the instruction of one so well qualified to teach, the son soon outstripped most of his compeers and at an early age of 18 was sent to Annapolis to commence the study of law. After attention to his preparatory course for two years, he was admitted to practice in the mayor's court and two years from this latter date was licensed from the chancery and some of the county courts. Finding the number of practitioners at Annapolis small, he settled in that place as a lawyer where he was soon, after connected in marriage with an amiable and intelligent lady by whom he had two sons and two daughters, all of whom survived their parents. The incidents in the life of Mr. Chase for several years were but few. Devoted to his professional duties, he not only acquired a respectable share of business, but became highly distinguished for his legal attainments. Samuel Chase, lawyer, patriot, justice of the U.S. Supreme Court, was educated in the classics by his father till he was 18. In 1759, he began the study of law in the offices of Hammond and Hall at Annapolis. He was admitted to practice in the mayor's court in 1761 in chancery in certain of the county courts in 1763. In 1761, Chase was chosen as a member of the Provincial Assembly. He was from the start distinguished for his opposition to the royal governor and the court party. On one occasion, he voted for a measure which reduced his father's income as a clergyman by one half. He took part in the riots that were staged by the Sons of Liberty when in 1765 the Stamp Act was enacted. The mayor and aldermen of Annapolis called him a busy, reckless, incendiary, a ringleader of mobs, a foul-mouthed and inflaming son of discord. He characterized his critics as despicable tools of power emerged from his obscurity and basking in proprietary sunshine. From 1764 to 1784, Chase was a member of the Maryland General Assembly. In 1774, he was a member of the Maryland Committee of Correspondence and became a delegate to the First Continental Congress. The next year, he was a member of the Maryland Convention and attended both Congresses in Philadelphia. He supported the nom, nom, nom importation, I'm sorry, agreement against Great Britain, feeling the measure would force Great Britain into bankruptcy or submission. Reading from more sources here, of course, Samuel Chase of Maryland. Samuel Chase habitually lived at the center of a storm. His hot temper, reckless nature, and keen thirst for conflict assured him an army of friends and foes, ever ready to fight over any conceivable issue. In all probability, Chase was the most combative man in Congress in 1776 and the most uncompromising revolutionary after Sam Adams himself. Chase's character, in the eyes of Tory Maryland, was pungently depicted as, by the mayor of Annapolis who called him a busy, restless incendiary, a ringleader of mobs, 
a foul-mouthed and inflaming son of discord. So how does anyone end up with a nickname like Old Bacon Face? It helps to have an abrasive personality. From virtually the moment he entered public life, Samuel Chase was the sort of man who always managed to say something that rubbed people the wrong way. He had a gift for oratory that allowed him to crush an opponent with just the right turn of phrase. To protest the Stamp Act in 1765, Chase, the leader of the Annapolis Sons of Liberty, broke into the office where the stamps were stored, destroyed them, and burned the tax collector in effigy. After this demonstration, the loyalist mayor denounced him in the local paper. In an article printed in the same paper, Chase condemned his critics as nothing more than despicable tools of power. He railed, I admit, gentlemen, that I was one of those who committed to the flames. In effigy, the stamp distributor of this province and who openly disputed the parliamentary right to tax the colonies while you skulked in your houses. Others of you meanly grumbled in your corners and not daring to speak your sentiments. It's strange to think uh, it's strange to think of the 25-year-old writer of these words as the son of a mild-mannered preacher, but that was indeed Chase's background. His mother Matilda died shortly after childbirth, and Chase's father Thomas moved from the country to take over St. Paul's Church in the village of Baltimore. Physically, the boy grew to be a big man, more than six feet tall and solid who knew how to use his body to intimidate his rhetorical opponents. After studying law in Annapolis, Chase became a member of the Maryland Assembly and quickly gained a reputation as a virulent anti-Brit. He opposed virtually any decree made by the royal governor. His frady cat colleagues realized what a gift they'd been handed. Here was a man unafraid to speak his mind, even when he was picking on the most powerful people in the land. This was where the bacon-faced name originated, thanks to his reddish-brown complexion. Soon, he was sent to the First and Second Continental Congresses. Samuel Chase was the only child of the Reverend Thomas Chase and his wife Matilda Walker, born near Princess Anne, Maryland. His father was a clergyman who immigrated to Somerset County to become a priest in a new church. Samuel was educated at home. He was 18 when he left for Annapolis, where he studied law under attorney John Hall. He was admitted to the bar in 1761 and started a law practice in Annapolis. It was during his time as a member of the bar that his colleagues gave him the nickname of Old Bacon Face. In May of 1762, Chase married Anne Baldwin, daughter of Thomas and Agnes Baldwin. Samuel and Anne had three sons and four daughters, with only four surviving to adulthood. Anne died in 1776. In 1762, Chase was expelled from the Forensic Club an Annapolis debating society for extremely irregular and indecent behavior. In 1764, Chase was elected to the Maryland General Assembly, where he served for 20 years. In 1766, he became embroiled in a war of words with a number of loyalist members of the Maryland political establishment. In an open letter dated July 18th of 1766, Chase attacked Walter Delaney, George Stewart, John Bryce, and others for publishing an article in the Maryland Gazette Extraordinary of June 19, 1766, in which Chase was accused of being a busy, reckless incendiary, a ringleader of mobs, a foul-mouthed and inflaming son of discord, and faction, a common disturber of the public tranquility. In his response, Chase accused Stewart and the others of vanity, pride, and arrogance, 
and of being brought to power by proprietary influence, court favor, and the wealth and influence of the tools and favorites who infest this city. In 1769, he started construction of the mansion that would become known as the Chase Lloyd House, which he sold unfinished in 1771. The house is now a national historic landmark. He co-founded Anne Arundel County's Sons of Liberty chapter with his close, close friend William Packa, as well as leading opposition to the 1765 Stamp Act. So I think that's pretty much going to do it, guys, uh, for part one here. Um, you know, covered a lot, of course, early life, education, early, you know, rise in politics for Samuel Chase. Tomorrow in part two, we're going to take a look, of course, at the signing of the Declaration and then his life after that, his death, his gravesite and all that sort of thing. Uh, I'm not going to do any bonus footage here for part one. There definitely will be bonus footage in part two. Um, there's even a little bit of uh, fun information regarding his birthplace. Uh, I know that's kind of more tied to this part one, but I'm going to save it for part two. Uh, I've never actually been there, uh, so I want to save that bonus footage for part two and show you guys that tomorrow. So stay tuned for that. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this. Uh, thank you so much for your patience, the support, comments, questions, all that good stuff. Thank you for it all. And uh, yeah, stay tuned for tomorrow, part two of Samuel Chase. Thanks, guys. See you tomorrow.